I am constantly losing things. <laughs> Gift receipts, car keys, the QR code to show my vaccination status for this conference, and occasionally my own children. I was at Target with our youngest a few Sundays ago. He was five at the time. He is still five. <laughs> And uh, everything was great. We're having a great time. I was going through my punch list, getting the list. You know that list. And all of a sudden, he's right here next to me. And then a minute later, he's not. <laughs> Any parents here? OK, you know that parental panic that you experience when you can't find your child? So I felt that. Thankfully, thankfully, he was fine. He had just scampered off to the aisle, one over, and looking at some toys. And as we reunited joyously, right there in front of the Legos, two bays down from Barbie's Malibu Dreamhouse, I said two things to him. First thing I said was, I am so glad you're OK. The second thing I said to him was, when we get home, don't tell mommy. <laughs> so we get home, and the first thing he does is tell mommy. And mommy is not happy. I immediately make things worse by trying to explain that I hadn't actually lost our son. I had simply lost track of him, thinking that I'd get by on a technicality. Because in the moment, you know, that felt right. Looking back on it now, I see it was stupid. Because mommy is now very unhappy, and she gives me the look. You know the look? that if it came with a caption would say, I am so disappointed in you right now, and I'm going to tell you without saying a word. You ever get that look before? Boss, colleague, mother-in-law? <laughs> it hits hard. It hurts. You remember it. It stays with you. And the truth is, my wife, she, she didn't have to say anything. Because the truth is, when it comes to giving feedback, what we show matters more than what we say. So now that I've basically done a full-on confessional and told you about myself, I should probably just fill in some blanks. I'm Joe. It's great to be with you here. I help organizations design and deliver feedback without fear and show individuals, just like you and me, humans, just like us, how to experience feedback with joy, because it can be joy. And together, here at Work Human Live, isn't it great to say that? Isn't it great to say that? Together here at Work Human Live, right? Yo, that was lame sauce. <laughs> together here at Work Human Live. Yes. Trust me, you are happy you are not doing this through a screen, right? OK? Together, let's see if we can explore ways that we can make feedback sound and feel more human. I study feedback. I teach feedback. And the good news is that feedback, it's made a comeback. Yeah? Yeah? The organizations I work with, the companies I speak for, they're doing a really good job working on the messaging, the what of feedback. Is it clear? Is it specific? Is it direct? And that's a good thing. But it's not the only thing. Because if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that it's not just about the messaging, the what. It's about the mattering, the so what. Because it's not enough to just tell someone about the work that he or she is doing. We can't just tell them about the work. We have to show them that the work matters, that you matter. So let me see if I can bring this home for us here. Think back for a moment. I don't want to get the day off on a downer, but think back for a moment to a time when you either gave really tough feedback or got really tough feedback. Where were you? When did it happen? What happened next? How did it feel? Just take a moment and Reflect on that. So I'm going to put something up on the screen. And if you agree with this statement, will you please stand up? 
Here it is. Okay, okay, a few of you. All right, please continue standing if you don't mind for just a moment. If you're sitting right now, so two thoughts just entered my mind. Either you are still recovering from last night's really good time, <laughs> or the thought of feedback, the feeling that you had, it went something like this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love feedback, too. I love it when I don't have to give it. I love it when I don't have to get it. And I love it when it's over. If you were thinking that, will you please stand up? <laughs> hmm? All right, there's a little more authenticity. How about a round of applause for authentic moments? All right. Fantastic. Find a seat. So if that's how feedback felt. So imagine how it feels for another person. And is there something that we can do in our roles as HR leaders or as leaders of people or just as humans to make the messaging and the mattering a little bit better? So today, let's see if we can do that in three parts. Part number one, authenticity. How can we have more genuine conversations so that people feel genuinely good at the end of those conversations? Part two, empathy, the signature skill of feedback and of boosting well-being. How do we show people we know people and account for all aspects of them, personally and professionally? And then finally, to end off with energy, number three, the feeling that you sometimes get after giving feedback or getting feedback, it's a depleting feeling. It's an energy-sucking, vaporizing feeling. Is there something that we can do to be more restorative, to make us feel like more of ourselves and not less of ourselves? So how does that sound to y'all? We're in Atlanta, so I can say y'all, y'all. <laughs> so that's the plan for today. So let's start, let's start today with the authenticity. Okay, having these candid conversations, talking to people in the moment, because that's where all the pain lives, right? These in the moment, just in time conversations, that's probably why you're here today. So I know what doesn't feel good. Hmm? A praise sandwich. Mm -hmm. Hands up if you've gotten one of those bad boys before. Okay, hands down. Hands up if you liked it. Nobody. I know someone who did, your manager, <laughs> at least for a little bit, okay? Because praise sandwiches, they're like the fast food of feedback, okay? It feels good in the moment, but when it's over, you just hate yourself. I mean, it's like me taking comfort and refuge in a bag of salt and vinegar potato chips, which I did last night. At the end of the bag, you're like, what? Why? Why? <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to these prey sandwiches, you know, I get it. I get it why the managers give them. I get it why we give them sometimes. Because it's safe. It's familiar. And it's deliciously diplomatic. You can say everything and nothing all at the same time. And while that may feel like the safe option, it's not the best option because there are some problems. Research tells us there's really two. The first is that it dilutes the message, okay? When we're talking in code to people, praise, problem, praise, all sandwiched together, people have a hard time following our train of thought, following our message. What are we trying to say? Or even if we can sort of follow the message, we're only focusing on the back end of that sandwich, the praise, which comes at the end, because that's the last thing we remember. So you can leave that conversation thinking, check, I gave feedback. And the person who's in that conversation with you can feel like, check, I wasn't fired, and I'm not on a performance improvement plan. But neither one of those people are really served in that moment, because neither one really has achieved the objective. The other problem with the praise sandwich beyond the message is that it diminishes trust, okay? If you think about relationships, and you know, feedback really is a relationship. It's more than a report. 
what does that say about your relationship with the other person if you can't talk to that person in a way that is clear and candid and caring? I mean, if you think about a loved one and think about the conversations you have with that person, those conversations are real. Those conversations are meaningful. They put everything out there. But if you're in a relationship where people can't talk to one another, that, that's the first sign that there's a problem when people can't talk to one another. So when you have coded messages being passed around between manager and employee, that doesn't do much for the relationship. And furthermore, when the praise is warranted and it is sincere, and you do want to say something nice to the other person, they're thinking to themselves, wait a minute, what, what else is there? Because there's got to be something else, right? And the mind starts racing and bracing for that next thing. So it all feels just a little bit insincere and maybe a tad manipulative. Now, just to be clear, I have no problem with praise. Praise pays. We're at work human after all, right? You've seen the signs. So praise is actually a really good thing. In fact, um, I have a podcast called I Wish They Knew. It's a pretty good show. My mom listens. Uh, and recently on the show, we had Derek Irvine, your host with the most at Work Human. You know, real tall guy, amazing Irish accent. Um, so Derek was on the show talking about the power of recognition. And it is really powerful. It's powerful stuff. Because when you see people and recognize them for who they are, the best parts of themselves, you activate that sense of self, that self-efficacy. It also has a host of physical benefits, emotional benefits, social connection. It's a wonder drug, recognition. The problem isn't the praise, okay? The problem is the sandwich. So can we do something about that? Well, as a matter of fact, I think that we can do something about that. What if instead of serving a praise sandwich, we did this? Lunch is gonna be served, by the way, in a couple hours in case you're hungry. So a feedback wrap is a four-part plan for having more caring, candid, collaborative conversations about work that doesn't pull any punches, that doesn't dodge and disguise, that speaks right to the issues instead of speaking around them. And it's something that anyone can do with just a little bit of intention and attention and hopefully we'll do that today. So let's break it down a little bit here. So the RAP stands for what and where, reason, affect, and prompt. Reason, affect, prompt. Don't write that down. I've got beautiful slides to show you. Okay, so let's start here. What and where, okay? Now, whenever you are in a state of toxic stress, you produce one of three neurobiological responses. Fight, fight flight, freeze. We fight, we become defensive, we take flight, we run away from that conversation as quickly as possible. By the way, that's not just the person receiving the feedback, that's the person giving it, the avoidance. Or we freeze, we literally shut down. And that happens whenever we feel like we are under attack. And when you get a question like, can I give you some feedback? It ranks slightly, slightly below, can I borrow some money? But it also activates it also activates a stress response. And when that happens, we are thrown into a state of toxic stress. Now, that's an old spiel, nothing new to see here. But here's the part that a lot of people don't know. If you look at brain scans of people who have just gotten that question, can I give you some feedback? The cortisol levels in their brain, all that stress, it spikes, it goes wild, and it temporarily throws us into a state of paralysis, of a mental paralysis, where the best parts of ourselves, our critical thinking, our creativity, our executive function, the parts of us that make us, us, they go dark temporarily anytime our status or our safety is challenged. And that's a real problem because whenever we enter into these conversations, we are already starting at a deficit and behind the eight ball. So by talking about the what and the where, by giving it a context or a zip code, I suppose, then at least you've contained the feedback and now you can have a more constructive conversation because people know where the feedback is directed. It doesn't make it great, but it does make it not terrible, okay? So the what and the where. R stands for reason. 
And there's a few reasons to give the reason, okay? First reason is that we just want certainty, right? We just like to know. So I flew here last night uh, from Maryland, where we live, and we all boarded the plane, and it was looking great for an on-time departure, and then nothing. Like, everything was ready to go. The stoves, you know, everything was stowed, seatbelts clicked, safety instructions read, and then nothing. We sat there. And everyone started to get a little anxious and nervous, especially folks who hadn't flown in a while. They were really on edge. And all of a sudden, the captain got on the intercom and said, folks, just want to let you know that we're waiting for a passenger who had a late connection trying to make this flight, so we're just going to be a few more minutes. Thank you so much. And then it's a little paperwork, and off we go. That's great. I mean, we know it's not a check engine light. <laughs> we know it's not like a safety warning signal. Like, it's just some guy who couldn't get his act together and is like hustling. You know those people, hustling. I'm like, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Dude, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. Your flight was like five minutes ago. But that's all it was. So give the certainty. The other reason to give the reason is to address our lack of self-awareness. Research by Tasha Yurik, a friend and colleague of mine, shows that about 95% of us have only about 10% self-awareness, give or take. That is a massive discrepancy. That is a huge gap, right? Which means that if you look at the people around you in this room, 90% of them probably have toilet paper on their foot right now and don't even know it. Check your foot, okay? So by telling people the reason, we at least make them more aware of what they may not be aware of. But the real reason to give the reason is to show that you care. I care about you. I care about your work. I care about us. So I want to give you this feedback, and here's why. When you give feedback like that with a message of mattering, that's a different flavor of feedback. You might even say it's magical. David Yeager and his colleagues at the University of Texas studied the effects of feedback on students writing essays, you know, and they looked at two different types of feedback. One group of students got feedback, kind of generic stuff, good work, needs improvement. It's called a comma, moron. Try it once in a while. Or was that just my seventh grade teacher? <laughs> and that was one group. The other group got feedback like that, but with a small tweak, one post-it note with a 19-word encouragement that said this. I'm giving you this feedback because I have high expectations of you and know you can achieve them. They called it magical feedback, and it was. 70% of the students who got that feedback voluntarily revised their essays. And of the 70% who revised the essays, 90% of that group outdid the other group that just got the generic feedback showing that when it comes to feedback, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. So give the reason. A is for affect, okay? And here's where we move from blame to contribution, from a focus on errors to a focus on efficacy. And we stop pointing fingers at people and instead create a space for them to become more reflective about what it is that has happened. So instead of me saying, Johnny, you really did badly when. Johnny, you really messed up that meeting, like in a serious way, and I got to come clean it up. We change the frame to, Johnny, I felt bad when people at this meeting weren't able to talk because you were talking over them. I felt bad, Johnny, that this client now is feeling a little bit disconnected from us. We may need to patch things up. I know they're just, I know that it was not your intention, but that was the impact of this. So instead of saying, you did this, we change it to, I feel this. Because that gets to a universal human truth. People can argue with what we say but they are less likely to disagree with how we feel. So when you are having conversations with people in a way that focuses not so much on the blame, 
but on the contribution. What can happen next? What did it contribute? And what can, where can it go from there? That changes the dynamic, which brings us to the last part of this rap, the P, which is prompt. And here's where the rap really gets its vibe and is different from traditional feedback. You know, when we give feedback, we often do a lot of telling and selling, right? Telling people what we think, selling them on our view. And that happens a lot when there's a power imbalance between manager and employee because there's one view and one version of events and I, as the manager, am going to tell you what to see and what to do and it's going to be my solution for you. But when we approach with a prompt, we're not so much focused on our view. We want to enlarge and to expand the view of another person. We do that by asking questions like, okay, so what do you think? Where do we go from here? What's the best path forward? And in my work, I've seen one of two things happen when you start to ask this question at the end of the sequence. The first is that people still maintain a defiant, disagreeable posture. They are still in full-on fight mode. And that happens because there are some people who, for whom that is just, that is who they are and that's how they're wired. But that's good data because at least now you know it's something else other than the way you're giving the feedback. Because if you're approaching this way as a partner, not a power broker, with partnership, this is a totally different dynamic. It de-escalates everything. You've framed it, you've given a rationale, you've talked about the impact, and now you're asking them for their ideas. A reasonable person would stop and say, I had no idea that was happening. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to weigh in on my next steps. So if they come back defiant, full on fight mode, then at least you know there's something else going on here with this particular person. That happens rarely. What usually happens, and I've seen this countless times, is that people feel relieved and renewed. They're grateful that they've had the chance to be seen and treated like a human being, that they're actually looked to as a partner, not a pawn, and that here is a person, my manager, who cares enough about me and believes enough in me to tell me exactly what I need to do and to show me where to look, but not tell me what to see. This is a new flavor of feedback, and it's the fuel of trust. Because trust isn't managers just cutting people loose and saying, I trust you, good luck, and hopefully it won't be screwed up. Trust is the belief that given the opportunity, the people who are closest to the problem are the ones who are also closest to the solution. And when you let them go, let them go lightly. Give them the sense of ownership that they have the power to take their next steps. Give them that sense of responsibility that they no longer have to prove themselves to you. It's just a way for them to improve themselves. Give them that sense of fulfillment that you see me, you recognize me as a partner, as a person, and you want the best for me. That's a whole new message than just telling and selling, blaming and burdening. This is the feedback of trust and it is the feedback that gets results. So what and where, reason, affect, and prompt. If you give feedback this way, I don't want to give you a money back guarantee on your registration to work human live, but, but I think you'll see results because people start to feel like people and work becomes a little more human when we start to talk to people candidly, collaboratively, constructively. That's where the trust lives. That's where the impact resides. So that takes care of authenticity, okay? Share because you care with a rap. It de-escalates the tension. It, it takes people out of fight, flight, freeze mode. It gives people a better sense of themselves, of who they are, and where they can go from there. But if you really want to get good at strengthening this messaging, mattering connection, then we have to do more than show people we care. We have to show them 
that we know them, okay? And that brings us to number two, empathy. Empathy, it's a great word, it's a powerful emotion, but I think we cut it a little bit short. Empathy is more than just understanding how someone feels. Empathy is recognizing who someone is and honoring the knowledge and expertise and experience that that person brings to the table. Because if we're serious about improving well-being at work, yes, there are a host of things that we can do to restore that for folks, but ultimately, it's about knowing that people know you, see you, understand you, and appreciate you. That's the juice of well-being. And so showing them that we know them with empathy, that's key. And we have to right-size our feedback so that we are talking to people in a way that really captures them where they are in this moment of their careers, as people, as professionals. And there's some really interesting research that shows the interplay of feedback on expertise. So two groups of people. I, I would never have thought to design a study like this in my life, but they did. One group, high school students, high achievers, describing their ideal teacher for an advanced placement Spanish course, okay, como esta bien. The other group, beauty care experts, self-proclaimed, deciding on the kind of feedback they'd like to get about the kind of products they have, all right? So students and Kardashians, all right? So, so what was interesting, I, I think even shocking, is that for both groups, the feedback that was preferred was direct, was candid. For the students, they wanted a teacher who was gonna tell them if their pronunciation was correct or not. So yo quiero Taco Bell, right? How was that? How'd I do? Let me know. And for the beauty care folks, they wanted to know if, for example, the product they chose was made them look good or, or you know, was felt right. So, you know, this, this shade of red, is it, is it too much, okay? And so in both cases, they wanted direct feedback. And it's not surprising because when you look at where people are in their careers, either higher on the rung of expertise or a little bit lower down as novices, you actually see this play out very clearly. For experts, people who have you know, years on the job, feedback for them is about progress, okay? It is about candor. It is about clarity. It is about knowing if I am on this track that I have chosen, and am I moving fast, and am I moving forward, and is anything getting in my way as I continue to advance? So you want to tailor the feedback a little more deliberately, a little more strategically for that group because they want progress. When it comes to the other group of individuals, your novices, they need something a little different. For them, it's not about progress, it's about reassurance. They want to know Am I on the right path? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? For them, it's about coaching and context, and they want to sit with you and talk it out and schmooze over a bagel and a coffee or you know, in the break room. They want to just have a relationship. And so having that relationship and tailoring the feedback that way is so critically important. So I guess the big idea here when it comes to expertise and feedback, when the job calls for a shoehorn, don't bring a sledgehammer. Okay, so that's expertise. But it's not just about knowing where they are professionally. We have to really understand where people are in terms of their backgrounds and their lived experience. Uh, and I hope your workplaces are as diverse as they can be. And I mean that in every sense of the word because when we are different, that is our difference maker. And those differences become our strengths. They don't weigh us down, they give us a lift. But sometimes, just speaking from experience, it, having people from different backgrounds can sometimes get in the way of personal happiness. So my wife, who was raised in Colorado, surrounded by Birkenstocks and crunchy granola, when any time anytime things went wrong, you know, the cure for all of life's ailments was a little bit of sunshine and some fresh air, so, you know, that's how she was raised. Me, I grew up in a different kind of house. Growing up, 
in my house, the Percocet was right there next to the mouthwash. A little bit different. So shortly after we had gotten married, um, I needed to get my wisdom teeth taken out. And she told me in no uncertain terms, you are not getting a general anesthetic. Like you are not going under for this, like suck it up. And I was like, okay, 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 like, I'm, all right. I mean, we were married like five minutes. I wanted to please her. I'm like, sure, sure, of course. And so went through the process. It was four teeth, I still remember it. When I was able to talk, we didn't talk for a couple days because yeah, that. So the important thing here when it comes to experience is that show them that you know them and recognize that people bring a lot of different perspectives to the table. Those differences can be a strength and actually if you celebrate that in the feedback, you're doing more to create a work environment where people feel seen, heard, and activated as their best selves. Empathy is the signature skill of well-being. It is the fuel of feedback. And the truth is, empathy doesn't have to be taught. It's something that is ingrained, and we have it from even a very young age. Um, show of hands, parents here in the room, one more time. How many of you guys left kids back at home to come here to work human? Uh, guilty pleasure, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> Father of four, husband of one, I get it, all right. Um, so really interesting study here on the effects of empathy and especially on the ability of young people to adapt it. So for all you parents out there, um, think about the biggest battleground at dinner time. okay? What is the thing that you are doing all the time? I do this in my house, I don't know if, it's you, if you're like me, Please eat your, okay, thank you, I'm not the only one. Okay, now most kids would do anything they could to not eat the vegetable. Hirsch number three would be very happy to do anything, scheme anything to get out of eating those, you know, the broccoli. But here's what they did, it was really interesting. They took a group of five-year-olds and they brought them into a room and they put two bowls in front of them. One bowl had, I think it was broccoli, okay? The other bowl had those goldfish crackers that, you know, lifesaver, okay, for the kids, all right? Now, which bowl of food do you think the kids ate from? They're five. The goldfish, obviously, <laughs> right? So they're having a great time eating goldfish, having the time of their lives, and then the researchers did something interesting, because they always do something interesting. They started to eat from the same bowls as the kids, except when they ate from the bowl of goldfish, they had these disgusted looks on their faces like, oh, it's disgusting, it's terrible. And when they ate from the broccoli, they had the most delighted looks on their face, like, this is the best broccoli I've ever had, this is incredible. And then they waited, and can you guess what seven out of 10 five-year-olds did next? They tried the broccoli, not because they liked it, but because they saw someone else liked it. And that sense of empathy was activated even from a very young age. It's ingrained in all of us. We don't have to go to school to learn how to be empathetic. We don't have to take advanced courses or continuing ed. It's our natural set point to be empathetic, to be thinking of the other, to be thinking in the plural. And if we just stop, check ourselves, and look beyond ourselves, we will find that there is another person there who is waiting to be seen. And often, you know, you show this a lot. And this empathy, this visible sign of empathy is so palpable, we even have phrases for it in everyday expressions, right? We talk about people who are so strong, you know, they, they put on a brave face when life is hard, right? We are just absolutely appreciative of the folks who are sitting next to us in meetings and the conversations are ridiculous and they manage to keep a straight face, right? We know people, unfortunately, in our workplace who are so deceitful, so two-faced that the only thing we can say is that, yeah, they're two-faced individuals because unless you are talking to someone with a poker face, the face 
shows the feeling. And that's why it's really important, especially when we're having these feedback conversations, to be very careful about what we show, because what we show, remember, matters more than what we say. And when you're giving feedback, you got to be mindful of this. And let me show you why. So imagine if you are giving negative criticism to another person, right? They're showing you a design for um, a new logo for the company or uh, a, a new direction for your sales meeting. And you look it over and you're thinking to yourself, that's a really terrible idea. But instead of saying that, you say, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, okay. That's a really interesting idea with a positive disposition. So the researchers found that people afterwards rated the feedback from bad to better. It actually made the feedback feel less, less pointed, less edgy. And the opposite is also true. When you have something positive to say to another person, but you say it with just the most disappointed look on your face with scowls and frowns like, thank you so much for helping me set up for today's meeting. It was really great. Really appreciate it. Like with that flat affect, like people feel you differently based on what you show. So when you are giving the empathy, showing that empathy, be careful of what you show. Show them that you care, but show them carefully. So that's empathy. We've talked about authenticity, about, you know, share because you care. We've talked about the empathy, show them that you know them. But the last part of this messaging mattering connection is a bit of a puzzle. Um, it actually, it is a puzzle. And I call it the performance conversation paradox. This is really fresh research. Uh, you're hearing it here first, maybe, I don't know, okay? It's kind of fresh off the press. And it looked at the effect of feedback on the giver. Now, if I were to ask you, who on your team do you want in the role of a feedback giver? Would you want someone who is a high empathy person or a low empathy person? What would you choose? What would you say? Hi, obviously, obviously, because if I'm empathetic, then I have an understanding of who this person is and I understand that getting feedback is tough and I know that you're nervous because the quarterlies are coming up and that means we're gonna to start to have conversations about pay and promotion and yeah, all that. The problem by turning it over to the high empathy people these researchers found is that the people who are best able to help others hurt the most afterwards. And it's almost like an inverse relationship. The higher the empathy, the lower the effectiveness. So that after giving feedback, a high empathy individual feels totally depleted. And not just emotionally, but professionally is unable to manage tasks as well as they were before, feels a dip in productivity, does not feel as inspired and happy around the other people in the office, it really has a very pronounced effect. And the more empathetic a person, the more pronounced those effects become. And so what can we do to protect the protectors, to help the helpers? Because I don't think you wanna just now say, oh yeah, forget it, let's just hit them with a sledgehammer and not worry about the impact that it's going to have on the workplace. How do we make sure that the people who are best able to support others still feel supported? And that brings us to this energy piece because it's really, really important. So here are three things that the research shows will have a positive impact even when people feel like they're not quite themselves as a result. The first, if you're a high empathy person, plan recovery time. Just own it. Just know that if this is what's gonna happen, be aware of it, name it, to tame it, and make sure that you provide yourself with a little bit of time to recover when it's all over so that you can bring yourself back to level before you go on to your next activity. You can also strategically schedule the feedback around times when you know that right after that conversation, you have a low energy task or a low cognitive task. You're responding to email. You're uh, just going to be catching up um, on some paperwork. That's maybe a good time to front load that conversation because 
you know that you're gonna have the dip and at least now you've mitigated and contained the effects. And at the very least, show some compassion to yourself because you are after all a high empathy person. That's a good thing. You're a manager who is not just flexing your power, you are empowering other people. You see people as partners, not as pawns. You want the best for them and to bring out the best in them and not make them feel like less, but more. So show yourself a little compassion and say, hey, I know why it's happening. I'm gonna just let it sit for a minute and move on because tomorrow's another day. I didn't get to the job I needed to do. I didn't, I didn't cross everything off, off my list, but you know what I did? I helped another person. And that might be the win for this moment. Now, what if you are thinking to yourself, suckers, I knew it paid to be a low empathy person. I knew callousness paid. I knew it. And now we have proof. So first of all, I would encourage you to check those assumptions and maybe even seek some help because you're probably a sociopath. <laughs> but after you do that, there are things that you can do as well to manage your own mood. Because remember, you're not feeling the pain right now. You're low, you're, you're low empathy, high effectiveness, or at least your effectiveness has not taken the same kind of a dip. So what can you do if that's you? Well, first of all, I would start, like I said, with the self-check. Because guess what? Empathy is empowering. Humanity in the workplace matters. And your job as a leader is not simply to show them what you can do, it's to show others what you can do for them. And that's your opportunity. So think about what that is. If in the moment, you're not a sociopath, but you're feeling like, I just don't have, like, I don't have the chops right now to just really sit and talk and sob with you on this, then at least self-check and try to bring yourself to a place where you can have a little bit more empathy for the person in that moment. The other is to be their partner. Again, being the partner doesn't mean you have to change who you are. It just means you want to change who we are together, standing by them. And I've talked before about this idea of being a, a window gazer or a mirror holder, like when it comes to feedback. Uh, a window gazer looks out, tells you what he or she sees, gives you their view, their version of events. That's the power, that's the fear, that's the judgment. But when you're a mirror holder, your job is not to share your view, but to enlarge and expand someone else's view so that they see things more clearly for themselves. And when that happens, you've actually done the real work of leadership, which is not to just flex your power, but to share your power with others. And the last thing, Shift your view. Stop telling and selling. Start listening and learning. And realize that the more you open up this conversation to another person, the more you're going to learn. You know, right now, I don't know about you, but a lot of folks I work with, they, they're still hybrid, or some are even completely remote and virtual. Uh, and it's a tough time for feedback, because giving feedback obviously depends on a lot of factors. And, whether you're actually talking to the person in front of you or through a screen, that's another thing. But one thing that everyone has found to be helpful is that when we stop trying to force a change and instead provoke an insight, that shift in mindset is a really powerful way to get people to think more clearly, more collaboratively about these important things that are happening at work and for them to feel activated in the process. So. Let's see if we can bring this whole shebang together. We started today by talking about three ways that we can strengthen the connection between messaging and mattering. We talked about authenticity. We talked about the power of sharing because there's caring, of a feedback wrap instead of a praise sandwich, of letting people go lightly because that's where the trust lives. We talked about empathy. We talked about not only understanding how people feel, but recognizing them for who they are. We look at not just the work that they're doing in this moment, but how they see themselves, their path of progress, their ultimate career goals, and we try to recognize them for the great things that they're doing. We do that 
by activating their sense of self, by seeing them and by creating a space for them to do that by recognizing their expertise and their lived experience. And finally, try to look at one way to restore energy at the end of these conversations because feedback, it's fuel, but it can also leave you feeling empty at the end. And so how do you help people feel restored, renewed, and ready for their next steps rather than feeling like, oh, this again? If we're good about this, if we do a little bit of a better job of strengthening the messaging and the mattering, if we stop thinking about feedback as a weapon, but instead as a gift, and even more than just a gift, a deposit, something that people can take, put in their banks, watch it grow and accrue interest, and eventually pay dividends, then we're gonna do a lot of good for people's work, but also their moods. Not just the work they do, but how they feel in that moment. Because if we are truly committed to creating a workplace that is inclusive, that is productive, that leaves people feeling restored and renewed, energized, empowered, then we have to stop looking back on a past that people can't change. We have to start looking out at a future that they can. And by moving the conversation forward, not just the messaging, but the mattering, our feedback will be more human. And so will we. Thank you very much.